Hey guys, good evening. Todd Sachs of Sachs Realty and welcome to Tuesday Night Live. And uh, tonight, guys, um, I hope you all are safe and doing well. And, you know, now more than ever with people working uh, and schooling from home, um, spending more time at home, uh, we're going to talk about radon and uh, the health hazards of radon tonight. And uh, typically radon levels are higher in basement areas, but if you're watching tonight and you have a house with a slab that can be present in your home too. And uh, tonight, guys, this is how it works. So we're from eight to nine. I'm your host. Uh, Chris is on standby. Uh, he's our radon expert. And we're talking about radon for the next hour. So if you guys have questions, you're watching live, we would love to have you uh, kind of join in. Uh, I'm Todd Sachs. I am the uh, broker and founder here of uh, Sachs Realty. And I'm trying to see what's going on with my AirPods here. <laughs> um, hopefully you all can hear me okay. Um, I started Sachs Realty back in 2017. I'm a Maryland broker, but uh, I help uh, people all over the country with an awesome broker network uh, that I have all over the U.S. And we're so essentially we're real estate wherever you are. So if you don't have an agent, you'd like to discuss your real estate needs, you can hit me up anytime. All of our information at the end of the show will be in the show notes. If you're listening to this by audio, we're going to go over a couple slides tonight. We'll make sure that we uh, we we tell you what you're looking at. And without further ado, I want to um, introduce you to American Radiology or American Radon, sorry, mitigation um, company out of uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, Chris Colvin and Chris, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Hey, thanks, Todd, so much. So uh, as Todd said, my name is Chris Colvin, and I am the business development specialist at American Radon. So uh, I'm not a native of Minnesota. I did move uh, from out of state. I've moved around pretty much my whole life uh, just due to family stuff. But I'm here now, and I got uh, lucky enough to do this. So by by essentially, I my so by degree, I am an environmental scientist, but I found my way into this, and I absolutely love it. That's awesome. Well, we're really happy to have you here. How's the weather in Minnesota? It's, <laughs> it's very cold. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we about eight. We got eight point seven inches of snow the other day up where I'm at, wow. and some a little bit further south around the cities and further south of the cities, uh, they got closer to nine, nine and a half. So. Well, Chris, I want to. We're going to kind of debunk some myths here tonight. So I got to tell you, you know, in the industry, um, there are a lot of people that think that radon is a bunch of bunk, um, you know, uh, hocus pocus. And, you know, there certainly uh, there's a lot of backups and facts, especially from the EPA and um, the attorney, uh, the Surgeon General uh, that has put out from time to time and a lot of regulations. And I just want to kind of go over some of these regulations and for our listeners, too, because the listeners may be all over the country, um, maybe even out of the country. And I know you guys are dealing with radon, too. But here in the U.S., I'm just going to go over a couple of facts um, that I've uh, kind of researched here. Sure. Five states uh, require all new homes to be built following radon resistant laws. Maryland is included in that. 11 states require radon resistant new construction. Um, not sure what the difference is, but uh, 37 states require disclosure during real estate transactions. And uh, seven states don't have any type of radon disclosure forms whatsoever. Four states require tenant disclosures by the landlord. Um, 26 states have radon certification laws. Uh, and I know you were saying that Minnesota was, was just put into that the, this yep. year, uh, that you were required as one of those 26 states. Four states require testing in high priority buildings. Nine states require testing in daycare centers. 13 states require testing in schools. Maryland is actually one of those on the list. 18 states have radon mitigation laws. 12 states require a public education program or radon awareness program. And then it goes into 11 states impose civil penalties for misrepresenting radon readings. 11 states impose criminal penalties for misrepresenting radon uh, reading. So, um, Chris, um, is it hocus pocus? 
Absolutely not, Todd. So that's actually, and you touched on something there uh, a second ago that I think is really, really key. So not a lot of people even realize that radon is an issue. So I think that opens it up to a lot of speculation. But radon has actually been thoroughly studied since around the early to mid 80s. And there is a lot known about it. But unfortunately, only about 15% of Americans have ever actually looked into their radon levels or even are concerned about it. So education is a huge thing. And it's a great thing to know that, you know, there are states out there that require a public education program, because if you don't know about something that you can't see and you can't smell, you know, you're not going to know it's there and that it's, you know, more than likely if it's at elevated levels, it's going to be, excuse me, it's going to be harming you and your family. So. So you actually see where regulations will get more strict and probably all states maybe will end up uh, following the same guidelines. Do you see that happening? I honestly, that is a hope of mine. Um, it's, it's very scary to see, you know, that there are some states that don't have these, you know, don't, that don't have laws or don't have um, anything pertaining to people who do the installs of the systems that you don't have to be certified. Um, I am a huge advocate to have, you know, people be certified, whether it's for testing or for the mitigation, because if it's not put in the right way, it's not going to do you any good and it's not going to help your family. Yeah. So what is radon? So radon is a radioactive gas. And as I mentioned a second ago, it is, you can't see it, you can't smell it. And there's no way to detect it without, um, without a, without a radon test. So it's a gas that's, you know, it comes up, it's a byproduct or you have, you have this decay chain all the way from uranium, then it breaks down into other, what are called decay products. And then you eventually get to radon. Um, and then after all those decays happen, it's, it's floating around in your home because it actually seeps up through, and this is actually a perfect diagram. Uh, it seeps up through the cac uh, cracks and gaps underneath your home, and then it is able to get into your basement. So the whole yeah. point of having a mitigation. Yeah, and, what, and, and for those of you that are listening um, on audio, basically we have a slide that's up on the screen right now. And um, it, it, Chris kind of just described this. We're actually looking at below grade of a footer, right? And then the slab. So what, what's happening here? So what's happening there is uh, in the illustration um, is you're seeing gaps and cracks from underneath the slab that are allowing that radon gas into your basement. So when that radon gas gets into there and you're having, you know, there's, it's, there's no way for it to get out except for up and through, you know, if you open a window or if you're opening up other things um, that's, and that, you know, gets pulled around your house. So generally radon levels are going to be higher in your basement, but not always. Mm -hmm. So um, do all homes have radon? So not necessarily all homes. It really depends. So, you know, I mean, for example, if my house, if I had a high radon level, say I could have a, a level of eight, my neighbor could have a level of 0 0.3, which is essentially background. Hmm. So let's talk about the health risks. What, I mean, what, what are they? I hear it's the second leading cause of lung cancer. I mean, I don't know how they, how do they determine that? So how that works is that you have all your cases that are done from, so you have all your smoking related illnesses and all that other stuff. And that gives you, you know, gives you lung cancer and then radon being the second leading cause. What that does is that there have been cohort studies over the past decades that have actually allowed people to see the issues and the, the professionals to see the issues um, that, essentially when you breathe in this, when you breathe in radon and it undergoes a decay and then, so it's not just, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but when it undergoes the decay, what happens, it also releases polonium. So then you have an actual ion that's in your lungs and lodged in the lining of your lungs at that point. So, so there's scientific proof behind it. Absolutely. There is 100% scientific proof. And as I mentioned earlier, it's been studied very, very well over the last, you know, 35 years or so. Interesting. So, but I hear in order to have it be a health risk, I mean, you know, some people say they have to live their entire life in a basement or, you know, really have extremely high levels. I mean, is that true? I mean, I, you know, I know we, we see now, you know, being in the real estate business, we see so many people fixing up those basements. Um, you know, they're turning them into offices, schools, 
um, you know, extra living space. You have two people, you know, sometimes living and working in the house. Um, so how much, I mean, is there like a, a rule of thumb? I mean, how much time does somebody have to be in a basement or in a, you know, very high level, um, you know, radon inf infected house? How long do they have to stay in that? Is it a lifetime? So it's not a lifetime at all, Todd. So the interesting thing is, is that, so it's, a, it's a, what it comes down to is the exposure. So, you know, if let's say you have like, let's say a family member, if your kid, you know, is going through that stage or like, mom, dad, I'm going to be in the basement. I want to, I want my own room in the basement. I went through that, but uh, <laughs> it was, it's really interesting. But then if your kid's down there, you know, and he's being a teenager, she's being a teenager, you know, hanging out in their room you know, eight, nine, 10 hours a day, probably more so, you know, if, you know, that's where they sleep. Uh, and then now during COVID, you know, it's going to be, it'll be a big issue. So um, your levels aren't really what matter the most. It's the length of the exposure that you are being exposed to those levels. Is there a test that you can take? For the radon? I actually see, yeah, if you have it in your lungs that... You so the I think the actual medical recommendation, and I'm pretty sure, but I want to say it's a low-dose CT scan. Uh, but I would recommend looking that up to see, but there is no actual, like you can't do like an at-home test, but I'm pretty sure it's a, I think it's a low-dose CT scan. And that's the best way to tell if you have, if you have lung cancer. Do they say it shows up 20 years later? I mean, is this something that affects people of all ages? I mean, when do they see this actually affecting them? So generally speaking, and again, this, like when it comes to the medical side of things, I'm not a medical professional. You're not a doctor. I get yeah, it. Right? Yeah. But, and I just want to say that just so I'm not putting any Absolutely, information yeah. out there. Um, but yeah, so what it comes down to is that at least in my experience and from what I've seen, it's generally people that are a little bit older. And when I say, you know, I, the longer you're exposed to it, the more detrimental it's going to be. And then if you've ever been a smoker, um, that will actually increase your chances. You're actually about nine times more likely to have uh, health effects from radon if you were ever a smoker, even if you've quit. Um, there have been cases that I know of personally that people, uh, you know, they smoked for 20 years, quit. And then next thing you know, they're like, oh man, the radon in my house is X number. And I have lung cancer, but I quit smoking years ago. So, hmm. you know, what else could it have been? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So let's dive in. Let's talk about this let's stuff. So um, why are the lower levels in the house higher levels when you do find radon? Absolutely. So radon is actually a heavier than air gas. So there and there are many gases like that. But also, too, it's the, the point that you also have radon. And, the, and generally, intrusion is going to be from the basement where you are below, uh, below grade and then where you're going to see cracks in your slab. But you can have it with a slab, you know, on grade house, too, with no basement. Right. right? And you can absolutely still have, have radon issues there as well. So in, in that case, you're going to find that the levels are higher on the first floor if there's and no basement. Yep. In some cases. And then in other cases as well, if the house wasn't built properly or something was, uh, you know, like those, you have chases for pipes that go all the way to the upstairs. Uh, what can happen? And we'll discuss this later as well. Uh, the stack effects, so temperature differences between the outside and the inside of your home. Uh, essentially what happens is that the air from your basement gets pulled up that chase and then dumped into your upper levels. So in some circumstances, you can actually have higher radon, radon levels in your upstairs than you do in your basement. Interesting. So let's talk about the level. So I hear what it's called picocuries, right? It's that's a unit of measure for radon. And I hear that you want it under four, correct? Yep, that's correct. Yep. But there yep. is a caveat to that. All right. So, okay. uh, so the, uh, the EPA does say that they highly suggest that you mitigate if you are four or above. Um, but if you were even between two and four, if my house was at two, I would absolutely mitigate just because, and as we get into it later, I'll, I'll share some more facts, but if you double that, whatever your radon measurement is, if you double that number, that's roughly the equivalent of uh, the number of cigarettes you're smoking per day. So if you, for example, if you have a radon level of four, you're smoking eight cigarettes a day. If you have a radon level of two, you're smoking four a day. So me personally, I don't smoke. I don't want to smoke any number of cigarettes a day. 
So, so if you're a smoker, you're adding that to whatever you're smoking. If you're smoking exactly. a pack a day, yeah. 20 cigarettes or what have you, yeah. um, you're adding that on top of that's interesting. That's yeah, pretty scary. absolutely. Um, so how does somebody know if they have radon in their home? So you can do a radon test and it comes down to the testing. Gotcha. So we're going to talk about the testing because I can tell you uh, sellers sometimes, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. They want to cook the book, so to speak, right? Yep. They think yep. that they're going to do these little tricks and they're going to you know, <laughs> make sure that there's no radon in their basement. And uh, we'll see if that's possible um, or if not, is there a way, I mean, is there any kind of staining? Is there any kind of, uh, anything that you can see when you walk into a house, any deposits that it leaves in the basement? Nope, nothing. Absolutely nope. nothing. Nothing at all. Like a completely odorless. You can't taste it. Can't see it. Nothing. Yeah. So let's talk about testing. Let's do it. So, um, how do you test? So there are a lot of different ways and a lot of different methods for testing. And I'm sure I could bore you and your audience to tears <laughs> with the, with all the sorts of testing. But the easiest way to do it is uh, in some most states or even some states, I know Minnesota does it. Uh, you can log on to the Department of Health's website and you can order a test kit from there. And that test kit is a 72 hour test kit and it gets delivered to your home. You open it up, set it up then seal it back up and then send it to the, send it to the lab for analysis. Um, so in most cases, those are going to be like charcoal detectors, but there are also much more uh, in-depth detectors that you're not really going to see in a real estate transaction. So, you know, I, I've read a lot on radon and testing and, um, you know, certainly here in Maryland, we actually have one of our counties, Montgomery County. It's actually, it's a law that you have to, have the seller has to have a radon test uh, before that property can transfer. Um, I've read up on, you know, uh, some of the research, they say that you need at least the, the test in the home for 90 days or more. Is that true? No, that's absolutely not true, Todd. So when you are actually getting these tests, you can actually get a short-term test or a long-term test. So the difference between these is that sure, you're going to get a better idea of your average over a longer period of time. But even in most cases, a 48 to 72 hour test is going to give you a very, very good idea of the radon levels in your home. What about, I mean, so why do they say that? Why do they say 90 days? So the 90 days is if you have a short term test and then after that you can, if you want a better, if you want a better average, and I, we'll probably talk about this later, but the there's different times of the year where radon is concentration is actually be higher in your home. So if, you know, let's say you do that short term test during the summer and you do a three day test and then you do it in the winter, there are going to be there are going to be variations in that data. So is it because I mean, it, so it's higher in the winter, right? Is that That's true? correct. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Is it is it just because your house is closed up? Nope, not at all. So it's well. Yes and no, but mostly no. So what the issue is, is that in cold climates, especially like here in Minnesota, where, you know, if you leave your thermostat at 70 degrees and it's negative 20 out, um, you have a massive temperature difference on the outside of your home. And what that is doing is causing essentially a suction from underneath your home. It's called the stack effect. And what that does is that it actually lifts more air from out of your house and then it's just moving more air from your basement because it has to be replaced from somewhere. So once once you start getting that uh, that air intrusion from under the slab, it's bringing that radon with it. Hmm. So kind of explain the test. I mean, you order this, this test, this self-test. I mean, what does it do? I mean, how does it determine the gas? Is it falling? I mean, it goes on the floor. They, I mean, the gas falls into the test. I mean, you know, kit, I mean, what, how does it happen? Sure. So, and that is, there's actually a lot of different math and a lot of different formulas that go into this, but there's things called the equilibrium ratio, uh, meaning how, like what parts of the radon uh, decay products are going to be actually suspended in the air and measurable versus that are not measurable because they're stuck to the walls because, you know, they're stuck to the ceilings and stuff like that. So, with the charcoal ones, generally what happens is the, the radon is going to be uh, absorbed into the actual meter, or the, excuse me, the test kit. 
And then what happens is that the lab can actually take it, do an analysis to see how much uh, has changed from a baseline of zero being sealed up in the in the test kit, no radon getting to it, and then what's what has been exposed to after. Gotcha. So these are things that you can only get online, but you can buy them at Home Depot, right? I mean, can you get yep. these things on the shelf? Is yeah, there a absolutely. difference between us? So is there a difference between the one you would order from, did you say the EPA? Yep. So well, it depends. So for us in the Minnesota, you can order from the Department of Health. Uh, okay. you can, there are multiple radon companies out there. You can go on their website and order a test kit from. Uh, so there are multiple avenues and there are even digital monitors. Like you can even get on Amazon if you want and order a continuous monitor that'll give you your day, uh, your week average, and then also your month average. Gotcha. So any one better than the other? I mean, the it ones that you're really getting from the health department? Their, yeah. So, well, if you're ordering, so the same test kit. So if you're getting, you know, and I'm not doing, this isn't a product <laughs> like recommendation, but uh, you know, air check, if you have an air check test kit, all of them are going to perform pretty much the same. Um, but if you're getting in-home monitors that are digital monitors, um, what's going to happen is there may be variations in them just because of the production process. So there is always a chance to get a bad egg. But uh, when it comes to the actual test kits that be that are sent off to a lab, you're going to have pretty solid performance from all of those. So I guess you send this into the lab. Does the lab actually report the results to any kind of governmental agency, the EPA? Or are they like, is there a grid? They're tracking you. You have radon, high levels of radon <laughs> in your house. Right. So what they do, they actually send it back to uh, the owner. So as far as I know, I don't know that the labs themselves actually track that information. Um, I do know that uh, Minnesota is there does track uh, what levels or like what areas have higher levels of radon. So uh, Iowa, Iowa is actually the first, the worst state when it comes to radon. So you can actually find maps that show what's called the Rust Belt. And that's actually an area. So I want to say Minnesota is number four on the list. So you can actually see in, in what areas and even just based on geologic surveys, what areas are going to be they're going to, you're going to have a higher rate on concentration. Yeah. So you guys test. Yes, we do. Obviously. So what's the difference between what you do and what a, a home inspector that we would, you know, have uh, doing a home inspection, dropping the, the test in a home. And what's the difference from the self test to somebody like you? Sure. So we can actually do the professional testing. So what that means is that the results that we get and that we report can actually be used in a real estate transaction. So the reason why it's more beneficial to go with an analysis source where the company you are going with is the lab is that you can actually, or we can actually see if there has been tampering done on the, uh, on the actual monitor itself. Mm. So these like the charcoal monitors and stuff like that, that's going to be um, a little, a little bit different. There's really no way to tell, but what you're actually seeing here is uh, this is Jesse, the owner of American Radon. And what he's doing here is checking for what's called pressure field extension. And what's happening there, uh, he's just cored a smaller hole into the slab and he's measuring with a micromanometer the, uh, the, how far the suction point um, is going and making sure that there is suction all the way underneath that slab. So when it comes to testing, if you, you're always going to end up with a higher number um, if uh, like a higher number in pre mitigation and post mitigation, if you don't get suction underneath your entire slab. So what we were just looking at him drilling that hole and testing, I mean, that is, that's before the mitigation process starts, right? That's yep. after we've tested in the house and actually realized that it's a high level. It needs mitigation. Correct. Then we're going to do more of that. So we'll get back to that. Um, yep. So what exactly are you doing? Is it the same kind of charcoal test? Is that? Nope. So these are called uh, CRMs or continuous radon monitors. And what they do, they are a digital product. And there are only certain ones that are actually allowed to be used for uh, real estate transactions or professional transactions. So these actually go out, they get calibrated yearly uh, down at a lab. They make sure that they are reading properly and that they, if they're not reading properly, they fix them, then send them back to us. So when that test gets done, you're making sure that, and like you said, we'll get into a little bit later, but with those types of monitors, we can actually detect tampering a multitude of different ways. I can't wait to hear this. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, so, you know, there's the, the, the seller that the, you know, radon test, you know, kits go, the kits go in the basement and uh, 
then they're putting all the windows open and the doors and increasing the ventilation. So what happens when they do that? Let's, let's so, tell everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, don't try to get away with faking your radon test. We'll catch don't you. do it. Don't do it. It's, it's a, it's just not, it's not good for the person that's going to buy the home and you will be caught if you are getting a professional radon test. So how do so, they get caught? Absolutely. So with these monitors, when they're put into your home, they are not just checking the radon levels They're checking the temperature. They are checking the air pressure. They're checking the humidity and so many, so many different types of data that can be analyzed. So we will absolutely know if you take your radon kit or your radon test and you put it outside because we will <laughs> see the temperature either drop or go right up. And then out here in Minnesota, we'll like, you know, what happens or if people open up their windows, you'll see a pressure drop generally. And then you'll see the temperature start to drop because they're going to be opening them at nighttime when they're going to be asleep and it's going to get cooler outside generally. So, and you're also going to see, yes, a te very temporary drop in the radon levels as well. But as soon as <laughs> the best part is when those windows close, you watch it start to warm back up. And as soon as that airflow is not getting going to the outside, you watch that radon level go right back up. So it's, it's night and day. Do you see that? You, you do, do see that? it. You, yeah. You know, absolutely. I, so a lot, I wouldn't say a lot, but, and I, I also don't want to go into <laughs> any, you know, yeah, I just can't really go into specifics, but yeah. So what do you do? do? I mean, you find out, you know, you say, hey, you're looking at this thing. It looks like an EKG at that point, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. you know, the line's going up and down. And so what do you do? Do you so, fail it or do you call the agent back up and say, hey, there's been some tampering? I mean, or do you just say we had a wrong reading? No, not at all. So when when that when you do detect tampering, you do typically let the agent know. Um, and then they can talk to the homeowner themselves because you can probably imagine, especially, you know, when somebody's getting their home tested, they, they don't really want to admit that they have high radon levels and it's an issue. So talk about <clears throat> the licensing side of things. So you guys have like us <clears throat> CE that you have to take, you know, continuing education, absolutely stay up on. You know, the latest uh, stuff that's going on, I'm coughing too. <laughs> it's, it's not good, man. A good thing we're in separate <laughs> Right, <rooms>. no kidding. <laughs> that's right. We don't have masks on. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, the and I'm sure that the certification process looks a little different depending on your state. But in Minnesota, uh, you are, if you're going to give professional tests or you are going to um, do a system, excuse me, my, thro <laughs> my throat's getting all crazy. Sorry. <laughs> We have a question too, but we'll get to that in a second. Sure, absolutely. Somebody just asked a question. But yeah, so man, this scratch won't go away. Um, <laughs> but like, <clears throat> yes. So when it comes to that, it's very, it's very like the, the you know, fudging those tests is very obvious. Gotcha. Um, so we have a question from Clark. What is the natural level of radon in the environment? And then we're going to talk about in the house next, but as far as levels, but what is the natural level of radon in the environment? That is actually a great question. So generally speaking, your background levels are going to be anywhere from 0.4 to 0.6. So you will never actually see a radon level of zero uh, anywhere. Anywhere. Uh, anywhere so you will never see zero because you cannot actually get lower than the background so it's just like you know if you're trying to i'm tr i can't really think of an analogy but if you have x number of you know yellow legos or you know yellow candy in one bag and then you're gonna put all that yellow candy outside of the bag if you reach outside of the bag, you're always going to be scooping up yellow candy, even if you got all the yellow candy outside of the inside of that bag. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So how about inside the house? So they so say inside, four Pika Curies is what they say that you should do. They say that there's no safe level of radon in your home. Right. And so what are you trying to achieve you know, some want to get under four. I heard you say earlier when we were talking before the podcast, I mean, you had some low, low number. Yeah. What are you guys trying to achieve? I and mean, what should somebody try and achieve? Zero? 
So if you're going to try to achieve zero, you are going to fail every single time. But the way we look at it at American Radon, we want to get you as low as possible. So when it comes down to doing your mitigation, generally speaking, a good goal is to get below or to get below is uh, two. So there are companies will say, yeah, we'll get you below four. We'll definitely get you below four. And that's fine and dandy. But like I mentioned earlier, are you really okay smoking six cigarettes a day if your radon level comes back at three? So it it's really tough. So when you're when we're talking about the different <laughs> levels of a home and you're saying that it can be as much on an upper level as a lower level, when you're lowering the level in in the home, at least the level where you're testing, should you test each floor? So generally only test your lowest livable of your home first, because otherwise you are going to be seeing, (coughs) excuse me, this is for all the listeners that are listening and not watching. I apologize. This is, (laughs) you're going to be listening to me coughing through half this. (coughs) Um, so yeah, you're going to want to test the lowest level of your home first. And then if you have elevated levels down there, you can definitely test the, 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 le- the levels in the other parts of your home as well. Gotcha. But you never do that. Uh, me being myself or no, just me- as a company. I mean, you're not recommending if you come in and they're not selling the house and you're checking out the, you know, uh, testing for radon in the home. Are you testing each level or are you just testing the low level? Yep. So we're going to be testing the lower level. And then it also depends on the setup of the house. And so I don't really want to go into specifics because of client privacy and issues like that. But there had, there was a house that had a large opening underneath a uh, one of their main floors that was separate from their basement. It was built in like the 1800s. And those houses are very difficult to mitigate. I can tell you that. (laughs) Um, But so when that is the case, you're definitely going to want to test in the room above that, uh, above that space, just because you're, it's not really going to dump the radon anywhere. It's going to want to go up. So even though it's a heavier gas, but with those temperature differences I mentioned earlier, you're going to see that just, you're going to see that air being circulated up. So you definitely do want to test and it all depends on the, the, the measurement professional as well. And that's something that we're, you know, we're taught to look for. Gotcha. So let's talk about mitigation. Let's and do it. I, I have to tell you, you know, most of the mitigation systems that I see, I mean, I just can't stand the way they look. I mean, you have a yeah. beautiful house, you know, they pipe out the side of the house, they go up the outside of the house um, with white pipe, right. a lot of times the 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 pump, the fan is outside, and it looks terrible. I mean, it really does. And yeah. you 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 have to go all the way up what to the uh, so you have that, to go up, in that case. Yep. So you have to go up above the roof line. So it's going to be one foot above the roof line. Now, is it the roof line or the gutter line? It's the roof where that pipe passes. So if the pipe, <clears throat> so if the, this is your so. This is not really going to help for people that uh, that are just listening. I'm going to try and do both. So if you're looking at the slant of your house and you're going up the middle of that slant, you need to be one foot above wherever that pipe is at the side of that house. So you don't have to go one foot above the peak of your roof. You just have to go one foot above the, if you're going through the side. Wherever you're coming out. Exactly. Yeah. Wherever you're coming out of the roof, you need to be a a foot higher than the actual shingle or siding or gutter or wherever, whatever it is, whatever you're coming out to a foot Mm -hmm. higher makes sense. So that's why when I see them run them out the side of the house, they're going up a foot over the gutter. A lot of times I saw one the other day, it was actually just piped out the side of the house and that was it. Um, So let's talk about um, the, the mitigation, because I know in a lot of the new constructions so depending on when your house was constructed and whether your state requires these laws, there are some basic things that like in Maryland that you have to do, you know, you have to have a gravel base underneath your slab. You have to have a plastic, you know, barrier, a vapor barrier that goes on top of that before you pour your concrete. And these are things that are inspected. And then you have to caulk and seal up cracks in your concrete and your foundations and things like that. Yep. And then really now um, there are some, you know, uh, you know, basically limited systems that builders put in, um, but they have to plan 
for if more is necessary at a later testing when the house is sold or if the buyer tests later, now you have to, in, in many states, actually put a junction box or an electrical box where you can have a switch in the attic um, and that and, and that it can plug in, um, you know, to be ready for those pumps because, right, they have to either be in a unconditioned space, the attic or outside the fans, right? right? Yep. So, so anyway, so we know that that's happening now in a lot of areas, a lot of states of new construction, but let's talk about those, you know, the houses that you're mitigating that have been built, you know, I don't know what, 10 years ago back. Yep. Something like that. I mean, when we're seeing. Sure. There's yeah, the new so, building codes. Yeah. So as of, I believe it was June 1st, 2009 is when you're going to start seeing these homes with all the requirements that you mentioned. So <clears throat> I really apologize. This is, it's, I'm baffled by it. But anyway, uh, so as of June 1st, 2009, uh, it's when you're going to start seeing these um, these passive systems. So when I say a passive system, it will be installed in your home, and it's just going to be a pipe with no fan. So the issue with those is that um, if they are constructed completely perfectly, like 100% perfect, no issues, no shortcuts were taken, those passive systems are only going to re uh, reduce your radon levels by about 50%. And that's if it's perfect. Uh, more realistically speaking, you're only going to see a reduction of about 25 to 30%. So when it comes down to it, you are essentially like you were mentioning the junction box and different power areas uh, up in the attic. What that allows uh, radon uh, mitigation companies to do is come in and just install one of those fans. Uh, and that fan uh, right there is, so what you're looking at, this is probably above a garage or it could be in an attic. And uh, what that what happens there is that we come up through the ceiling of either the garage or wherever it comes up at, and you can install the fan. And then as long as that junction box is within six feet, uh, you plug into that and then you go out through the roof. Which is the better looking way of doing it. So let's talk about <clears throat> you're actually core drilling into the concrete. Yep. So you're, you know, putting in your system. I think we have a picture of that too. Yep. <clears throat> and I think you said what, that's a five inch core bit that is drilling in. You're going to drill down through that concrete. Yep. Right. Yep, so go absolutely. ahead and take us from there. Sure. Yep. So once you're drilled into that concrete, you're going to go ahead and core out that area. And then once that area is, or once that has been cored out, uh, what we're looking at here is actually, again, Jesse, the owner of the company, and he's taking airflow measurements to see how much airflow is actually able to be pulled out from underneath of that slab. So, so how do you pick the spot where you're going to drill? So and do you try and find the best place? I mean, if it's a finished basement, you're not going to put it right in the middle of the room. So where, right. who determines where it goes? So, and that is, I, I'm so happy you actually asked that question. So, cause I love using the term, but uh, so there's a term that we use in the industry called poke and hope. And you poke and you hope that you get the proper suction underneath the entire house. It's like drilling um, a well. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so if for us, what we do, and it really depends on the type of system. So there are two different types, two main types, I should say, of uh, mitigation in homes that we do, which is either to be drain tile depressurization or sub slab depressurization. So if you have drain tile, you can just tap in anywhere along the border that that drain tile is. And then what that does, that just gives you an access to the entire perimeter of the basement and or whatever area that that drain tile is in. So instead of just pulling on one small hole, I shouldn't say small. So, cause generally speaking, the, the suction pits that we dig are anywhere from five to 30 gallons. So we remove five to 30 gallons of material out from under the slab. But that those drain tile systems actually have a little bit of settling and then it allows you to pull air from everywhere rather than just one spot. And then when it comes to the sub slab depressurization, those are a little bit more difficult and that's when you're gonna start seeing the, the larger suction points, multiple suction points and so on and so forth. But when, and like I mentioned earlier, that picture of Jesse doing the test holes, um, you, what we're doing there is actually making sure that the placement of that suction point is appropriate. And then if that is not an appropriate area, you can actually just, because we don't drill the five inch hole right away. You can drill test holes and then see which ones are going to work better. 
And then in some cases, like you even mentioned a finished basement. And a lot of times it, it's, it can be pretty tough because, you know, like you said, you can't really just drill a hole right in the middle of somebody's basement. So we, we try to get to like the mechanical room and we, and there are also, also if you can't get out of there with pipes, uh, there are methods called stitching and you can core multiple holes and you just dig a tunnel underneath each of those holes. So I'm just kind of curious. So, I mean, we get prices for clients all the time to do these mitigation systems and they'll come back with like 600 bucks or $750 or something like that. Um, how do they, I mean, if they're not testing, like you just said, to see whether you're getting that flow to actually be able to reduce it. I mean, how's, how are they doing that? Yeah. So again, that, and I don't want to, you know, call into question anybody's integrity, but because, you know, there are so many great people in the radon mitigation industry, but um, it definitely comes down to you get what you pay for. And there are going to be a lot of people out there who are like, yeah, I can absolutely do this for you. And, you know, 750,000, you know, in that range, and they're going to come in and they're going to poke a hole in your floor and give you the biggest fan possible. And will it work? Maybe, maybe not. But when they went, the bigger your fan is, the more you're looking at in energy costs. So it's not unheard of for some of those larger fans and even, I should say, medium-sized fans. If they're turned all the way up and your house hasn't been sealed properly or the mitigation specialist didn't do a proper sealing job, that that fan will cost you over $1,000 a year to run in electricity mm. costs. And I mentioned sealing because because if you don't seal, you're also be pulling conditioned air through those cracks, and this is a perfect example of uh, you know a ceiling happening. So, really, even a dime sized crack, you can actually have um, you can actually air can be being pulled through once the system is running, and if the system's not running, you can actually have air coming into the house through that crack. Hmm. So, sealing by itself is not effective. You like you can't just seal a crack and hope that the radon is going to go away. That's not going to happen. Interesting. So um, getting back to, you know, determining what is going to work, what happens when you drill the hole and you have absolutely no airflow? You know, it's a, the slab is just sitting on the dirt, essentially, you know, you're dealing with an older house. What do you do in that situation? Yep. And that is also a great question. So if you come into that type of situation, um, in most cases, and the older the house, generally speaking, there is going to be a little bit more settling just because of the time that has passed since it was built. Um, but I can tell you for a fact, I know, uh, there, we had a crew out on a job today and the entire underside of the house was made, it was clay. Um, so pulling air through clay, <laughs> as you can Not imagine, gonna happen. Yeah. is very tough. So when it comes down to that, uh, you actually have to core a hole, take as much, even, I mean, 30 gallons, like I said, five to 30 gallons is pretty average, but I, I believe our, the, the owner of the company, I think he said he's pulled 50 or 60 gallons of material out from out from a single hole before. Um, so it really comes down to the amount of work that you have to do. Um, and if you can't get airflow uh, under the entire slab with one suction point, you can install two, you can install three. Um, I've seen homes that I've done and that uh, the, the crews that, uh, here at American Radon have done four suction points. And, you know, it, it gets a little more expensive, but... That's, again, what you get when you're going to pay for that. So, Chris, if you talk about four suction points, are we talking about four pipes coming up out of the out of the basement through the roof? So you're only talking about one going out of the roof. Okay. So what you can do, you can actually connect all four of those suction points, and then you have valves on those points that allow you to determine how much you want to pull on which part of the house. So how do you guys give estimates? I mean, do you go out and drill test holes and things like that before you even give a price? I mean, how, you know, how do you know what you're going to get into? So, and that's part of the fun of the industry. So before I was even allowed to go out and do bids uh, or anything like that, I had to be on the job and do some training with the owner of the company for several months uh, in order to make sure that I knew, oh, look, <laughs> a lovely picture. There you are. So this is actually a house. Uh, this is actually, it's funny you had this one because this one actually has four suction points in it. So, um, and you can actually see the valve on that right there. And that allows us to dial in uh, how much we're pulling on. But once you go in and you're inside of the house and you've done enough of these, you get a pretty good idea on what's going to be required. So you 
you never actually know unless somebody's doing construction on their basement um, and they've jackhammered out the floor if they've put in aftermarket drain tile. You're not really going to know what underneath the slab looks like. But if somebody has drain tile, you are very, I mean, it's going to be a much easier install because when you have drain tile, generally speaking, you're only going to need one. But if you get into the job and then you're like, okay, there's no drain tile, multiple additions, multiple levels, like four level splits, those I'm, I'm still learning how to do those. Um, so there are, there are very, very different ways that, you know, that you can do mitigations, but knowing how to do it takes time and practice. So we have another question here. Um, is it important to seal your basement ductwork to reduce the spread of radon throughout your house? Yep. So thanks again for that question, Clark. Uh, yes. So when it comes to sealing, like I had mentioned earlier, just sealing your basement alone uh, is not going to do that. But uh, you actually, in there, you had asked about your subslab ductwork. Uh, subslab ductwork is an entirely different beast that uh, I'm actually very surprised uh, that was brought up here tonight. But so subslab ductwork can be a major issue and can have a massive, massive uh, impact on the, the radon itself, the radon levels. So I have done a, and I know the owner's done more, but I have personally done one where the owner actually completely abandoned that subslab duct work and allowed us to tap into that system and or to tap into the duct work and be able to pull air from underneath the slab on that. So we got an entire perimeter. But the problem with that is once you abandon that duct work, you have to put in all new heating and cooling. So it, if you can, and if you, and if you are going to pull off of the duct work like that, you absolutely do have to seal up the, that ducting and all the vents and stuff like that. So great so question. Ruth is asking, um, she said that she's seen them put the, the radon system in the sump pump and they actually sell those pits like that, right? So that it can accommodate um, the, uh, the radon pump. Is that an effective way to mitigate? So we try not to do it like that. And thank you for the uh, question, Ruth. So we, you can absolutely do that, but we'd like to try to get a little bit further away from the sump pump, just in case there are some air leaks and stuff around there. But if you are going to pull off of the sump pump, it is absolutely critical that that sump pump is completely sealed. So the way we do it is we cut a Lexan sheet and then we cut an access hole that can be plugged with a special like it's like a, it's a, it's an air sealant essentially you silicone all the way around that and you bolt it down. Um, but that needs to be completely like airtight. And then at the same time though, if, you know, if you see that it's also critical that, you know, the homeowner can get in there and open up that and trigger it manually if they need to, and also to replace it. So there it's very, you know, like I said, yes, you can pull directly on the sump pump, but again, like the sub slab or the, excuse me, the, um, drain tile depressurization that I mentioned earlier. Um, we'd like to try to tap into the to the actual drain tile that drains into your sump pump just further out down the line. So um, as far as when you're installing these systems, are you testing right afterwards and then giving the new result? And then if you find out that you haven't achieved what you're looking for to get it under the two uh, Pico Curies, what do you do next? Sure. So at the end of all of our mitigations, we actually do include a free test kit uh, as part of our package. So we give that to the homeowner and within 24 hours of turning in, excuse me, 24 hours after your uh, system is running, you can start that test. So, and that is enough time for the, the radon in your home to have dissipated just from open windows and all that because you're not pulling air from inside the home with the system. You're just not allowing that gas to get into your home. So once that's started up and they do that test and we get the results back and then we give those to the customer. So like I said, um, we don't, so below two is an excellent result. And that's one thing we really pride ourselves on. And uh, I think I mentioned earlier, our averages since 2018 is 0 0.4. Um, but with that being said, if we don't get as low as we would like, um, and this is actually a really cool something. I'll actually bring, ask you to bring that up uh, in a little bit. But what that does, that shows that your uh, that, well, that one that system's actually not on. That's actually a pre uh, a pre system being on photo. But what that does, that shows you that uh, the amount of suction that's being applied to your system. 
and you have that little hole in it that you drill and you have a little tube that's going into that hole. Yep. And that's sort of like, uh, is that part of the alarm to let you know if it's not? Nope. A, so, can... so that alarm, the alarm, the, the, the alarm is actually the piece above that you see. It's like that separate, uh, that it's that separate object. And what that does is it actually allows you to, if, if that, if it detects no airflow has, is going across it anymore, it, the alarm will sound. That tube, uh, we call it a U-tube. Um, what that does is it's a visual, it's a visual gauge. So it's literally the shape of a U. And then before you turn the system on, you can see that in that photo that the liquid is level with zero. And then once that uh, system is on, it will pull some of that liquid in there up and it'll show you that it's working. But if you're not, if it's not an area that is constantly monitored, or if you're not the kind of homeowner who wants to take an active approach and looking at that every single day to see if it's still working, that's when an audible alarm is really helpful. Gotcha. And then that basically just means your fan for some reason probably stopped working, right? Either gave yep. out. And some of these fans you were talking about, they're good for what, 10 years? So this yep, radon, five to 10 years. This radon fan runs continuously. Yep. So you brought up a, a really good point. So you are going to see that show up somewhere on your electric bill. So I guess the more expensive fans, are, they're going to run more efficient. Is that the way, is that what you were describing? Not necessarily. So this okay. kind of goes back to, and like I was saying uh, earlier, um, it comes down to what you pay for. So if you're going to pay for somebody to come in and do your diagnostics and to do all these other things, do all your ceiling, make sure they're not skipping over any ceiling. Um, you're going to see that return on that electric bill. Because if you're not sealing cracks, you're pulling air that you've already heated and cooled under through your slab and then just blowing that heated and cool air out your roof. Yeah. So that it comes down to making sure you're sealing everything properly. And then in some, I'm not going to mention the name of the company because I don't want this to turn into an, an advertisement <laughs> for radon people, but there are some companies that uh, you can actually dial their fans up and down and then you can also gain energy savings that way. Gotcha. So before we talk about, because lastly, I want to talk about radon in drinking water. Sure. And a lot of people don't think about that. You even said that rarely do people even test that, but that is a way of radon coming into the house as well. If you have a private well system, yes. um, but really, I mean, this is this information that you're giving. I mean, it's very valuable. In fact, it makes me want to test my, my, my home for radon. <laughs> Uh, I know a guy you know, will sell you a kit. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I bet you do, and I and I think you know we're gonna, we're going to get that taken care of sooner than later. But this is really something serious. I'm yeah, sorry, I, I lost mean, you there. For I said this is really something serious. Absolutely, I mean, you, very serious. You would recommend. So I guess the big message out here, if you're a real estate agent and you're and you're you're watching, um, is that we really need to be more educated on some of these hazards that can happen in the home, especially, like I said, with COVID going on, people are, they're staying, they're at home more now than ever. I mean, you think people have been out of the office or out of the home to go to work sometimes eight, 10, 12 hours a day. Um, we've been really closed up inside our home since March. Um, so I, I think it is important that people have their homes tested and and do something about it if they have these high levels of uh, of radon in their home. But I think as professionals, we need to really take an active role to make certain that if we're on the buyer side of the transaction, it may even be worth that buyer spending a little bit of the money. I mean, here we are, we're always looking for the seller to do something. A lot of times, guys, when sellers are selling their home, they want the cheapest way out. They want to spend the least amount of money because they're gone, you know, and that's not always the case, but it is the case a lot. So I think the biggest lesson learned for me that I'll, I'll take back to my agents is really, you know, let's not focus, let's focus on the, the health and safety and well-being uh, while they're home and for their family. And let's make sure that we're an active part of this testing process I mean, usually we're hiring the buyers or hiring the, the the radon tests, but really let's take an active role in the mitigation system and make sure that we're doing the right thing. Uh, well, certainly, and Chris, I'm sure, I mean, Chris is in Minnesota. He's not going to come in our area and, and, and mitigate for in Maryland, or if you're watching from Texas, I'm sure he's not going there either. Um, but I think Chris and, and I... And, 
we're going to publish all of Chris's information. So if there is, um, you know, in the show notes, you will find we will publish when once we're done with live and and we actually you know, push this out. Um, go ahead and reach out to Chris. Chris, it's fair fair enough. There they. You're happy to have them do that, right? Absolutely. And Reach. that's one of the big things is we really believe that education is key to getting people safe because, like I said earlier, only 15% of people think this is an issue, but it is actually far bigger than that. Yeah, sounds like it. So real quick, talk about drinking water. We got about five minutes left. Sure. So for those people that have wells, is there a concern? So I will always say that if you have a concern about radon, test your air first, because the chances of your water being the issue and what's bringing the radon into your home, it is going to be the, the amount that the water brings into your home is going to be far, far less than the cracks in your basement of your 1920s home or however old it is. Um, but with that being said, it can still be an issue. And I don't want to downplay it to the point where everybody's like, oh, it's not a big deal. Because again, any kind of radon getting into your home, any level is not safe. But yes, it is absolutely possible for uh, radon to get into your into your home through well water. And and what's happening, just so people understand, the concern is not drinking it. Right. It's when it comes out of the shower head and bounces off the walls and it's breaking. The, is that where the gas is being released? Absolutely. So, so you're, you're in the shower smoking a bunch of cigarettes, <laughs> right? I mean, yep. well, while you're getting wet. Okay. Yeah. One one last question. Stephen uh, Kehoe has asked, are there maps available showing where radon is more likely to be an issue? Absolutely, Stephen. Thanks for the question. So that is something you can uh, check out on Google. Uh, I would just recommend looking up the uh, radon rust belts. Uh, generally speaking, it's going to be in the Midwestern states. Uh, Iowa is going to be your most dangerous uh, state, or excuse me, your your highest uh, radon levels uh, of con but just per capita. Uh, Minnesota's number, I want to say four. So in Minnesota, two and five homes will test higher than four, or excuse me, two and yes, two and five houses will test higher than four. That was a lot of numbers. Which is why you guys have a, a radon mitigation company in Minnesota, Absolutely. right? I mean, it's a, a great yeah. business, I'm sure. Well, Chris, I can't thank you enough. I mean, this has been great. Certainly eye-opening for me. Um, I have to admit, I mean, I, I came into this conversation with a lot of speculation. Um, the biggest thing for me and guys, um, you know, there are ways of installing these mitigation systems that don't look terrible, you know, out of a you know sure. beautiful sided house and have this you know, white pipe just extending the um, the absolute um, most horrible uh, looking pipe that you can imagine uh, coming out of the house. So explore those options. For and sure. um, and guys, you know, stay safe. Uh, we thank you very much for watching and tuning in. And uh, we're going to keep bringing it to you every Tuesday night. So if you're watching uh, on social media or YouTube, uh, if you would hit the subscribe, like, or follow, and certainly share us and hit those alert bells as well. You can also do that on Facebook now. There's an alert bell that uh, will allow you to let um, you know when we go live. And uh, guys, remember, um, if you have any real estate questions, feel free to shoot them to me. And thank you so much for tuning in again and have a great night. We'll see you next time.